Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to look at the cases of the Queen and JM and the Queen and Colette. And the reason why is that these are cases that really help define uh, what's meant by the ban on a particular sort of spiked ring that we find in the regulations. So let's start out with looking at the Queen and JM. It'll explain a little bit about what we're looking at here. So we start off, this is a British Columbia decision. It's a provincial court decision. Uh, the reason why it's JM and not a proper name is that JM is a young person, so their full name would be covered by a publication ban. Now, the issue here is that he was charged with possession of a prohibited weapon, and the specific prohibited weapon is any finger ring that has one or more blades or sharp objects that are capable of being projected from the surface of the ring. All right, so that's still in the regulations. That's still something that's banned. So that's uh, something worth looking at here. So the young person is charged under Section 90 Sub 1 with possession of a prohibited weapon, namely a spiked ring. At the conclusion of the Crown's case, Mr. Caccioni, for the young person, moved for dismissal of the case on the grounds that the spiked ring in question was not in law a prohibited weapon under paragraph D of the prohibited weapons order. So what this is, is he's asking for summary judgment on this which is a bit of a tall order, usually. Uh, in order to get that, you have to basically show that the Crown's case is, there's no evidence on some key element. Here, he's saying, you know, listen, they may have proved that it's something, but they haven't proved that it falls within the, uh, the category of a banned, banned item here. So, generally, the Crown doesn't like when there, there's a, a, a non-suit against them, which is what he's seeking here. So... The ring is in evidence, and I suppose spiked ring is a fair description of it. It is made of metal, and on the side facing out, it has a skull surrounded by spikes or protrusions, which have been filed down or blunted to some extent. It is difficult to measure the height of the spikes because of the design, but I should say between one and two centimeters uh, at a maximum. There is not alleged to be, nor does there appear to be, uh, or appear to me to be any hidden mechanism in the ring, whereby a more lethal blade point or projectile could be deployed. It is solid state. It is of cheap and crude manufacture and is, I am told, readily available for purchase in Vancouver. It is commonly called a death ring according to the vice principal of Sir Charles Tupper School. It certainly is capable of being used as a weapon in the nature of a knuckle duster. Of course, so can any ring. Now, I'm just, whenever I see something sort of that seems a little dumb here, I kind of want to look it up and see what's going on. So I've just plugged death ring into Google image search. I'm seeing a whole lot of sort of different styles of rings. I guess one of them up here kind of might, you know, has some points. This notion that uh, this is sort of commonly known as a death ring. I don't know, maybe in 1989 things were different, but... I think that this is not sort of, I don't know. I don't know why the vice principal of Sir Charles Tupper School said that. That doesn't make any sense to me. I've never heard of a death ring before. That's, yeah, okay, moving on. Miss um, Weideman of the uh, Crown has cited three cases for the proposition that a spiked ring of this type is a prohibited weapon under paragraph D of the order. So they had prior precedent here. But all of these are decisions of my colleagues in the provincial court. The reason why the judge is noting that is that, uh, you know, he's, the judge isn't bound by this deci these decisions. They're persuasive. And so we'll see what the judge does, but let's have a look at the decision. Uh, the first is the Queen and Buchan, a decision of His Honor Judge Metzger. Here's what he said about a finger ring that had a fixed blade protracting from it. Uh, so, any finger ring that has one or more blades or sharp objects that are capable of being projected from the surface of the ring, I am satisfied on the simple reading of that. It is not necessary for me to speculate that the objects must be hurled or set out from the surface of the ring. It is satisfactory, as in this case, there is one blade projecting from the surface of the ring. I find the accused guilty as charged. So, he convicted in that previous case, the Queen in Buchan, for a ring with a single blade sticking out of it. Second case is the Queen in Marchuk, a decision of His Honor Judge Reed. 
In that case, there were three rings of a different design, horned animals, heads instead of a skull, and more dangerous in that they were apparently usable together as a real knuckle duster. But essentially, they were the same in that they were all solid state. Here's what Judge Reed said in an oral judgment. The key words in the section are sharp objects. I am quite satisfied that all of these rings have sharp objects, and they all project outwards and that are capable, which includes any use to be applied, of being projected, and we have some difficulty with the word projected, and I will give what I think the word means, from the surface of the ring. I've concluded it does not mean the projected is, as it were, shot out of the face of the ring, but rather projected much in the same way as a shell is projected from a cannon by the placement of cordite powder as a separate matter uh, behind the shell, the powder being fired and the shell being fired out. Only thing in this case is the rings being in place and they are projected in the sense that the person's hand behind the rings, presumably clenched, projects outwards, and hence the definition is then not tortured beyond what, it, what could be expected in trying to deal with the whole classification of these things. So he's saying, you know, in order to avoid a, tr a tortured definition, uh, we instead of viewing these as, you know, something that's fired out or whatever, he uses this cannon metaphor and says that when you, you know, swing and, you know, you throw a punch, that that's being projected in the sense of, you know, a cannon projecting shot. That seems to me like a fairly tortured definition. You know, he's saying, I'm trying to avoid a tortured definition, but that seems like a tortured definition to me. So I'm not super thrilled with that particular uh, metaphor here. Then after referring to Maxwell and the interpretation of statutes, so this is a textbook, uh, he goes on, a sharp object which is capable of being projected from the surface of the ring is not restricted to what the ring may do by itself, but rather the whole ring, points included, can be thrust forward in the form of a weapon. And I think that certainly stands within the general section and the general intent for these types of things. So, again, this seems to me that the judge might be reading things into it when he says, you know, projected includes swinging a fist. He convicts the defendant not without, without some reluctance at law, because I think that Mr. Moss has demonstrated that there are difficulties in interpreting this section. And while I have come to a conclusion, I am quite sure that other courts might not come to the same conclusion. This, to my mind, is a bit of a problem because normally statutes, it, particularly criminal statutes, where they're sort of unclear or vague in this fashion, uh, or there's sort of multiple interpretations, they should be interpreted in favor of the accused because Parliament was the ones who sat down and wrote this out, not the accused. The accused wasn't the person who had any sort of drafting ability. And if Parliament doesn't like the court's interpretations, they can turn around and fix it. They can say, no, that's not what we meant, and change the rules. Where, uh, So that's sort of a general principle of uh, criminal statutory interpretation, but that doesn't seem to be what's going on there. Quite the opposite when he says that I am quite sure other courts might not come to the same conclusion. Anyway, moving on. The third case is Claussen. A decision of his honor, Judge Baston, he was dealing with a simple spiked ring, and here's what he said. Mr. Roth submits that the definition I have referred to seems to envisage protuberances that can be ejected from the object. That may, in part, be part of the definition, but something that is capable of being projected also applies to something that simply is projected, in my opinion, from the surface of the ring. The protuberances that have been described by Mr. Hilton and exist on Exhibit 1 are projected, of course, from the surface of the ring. So he's adopting, in this case, a definition of projecting that just means that they're sticking out as opposed to that they extend or anything along those lines. As to the definition of the word project, in the or dictionary definition handed up to the court, definition number four reads as follows. To cause to protrude, and that covers the situation with respect to exhibit one in my view, that the items uh, that are projected from the ring are protuberances. Lovely language, protuberance. So again, this court basically, that previous decision essentially said that any spiked ring was a prohibited weapon under this section. So the court moves on to sort of examine this a little further. They say, now, well, with the greatest uh, respect to my learned colleagues, 
I might indeed be tempted to differ from them on the application of paragraph D to solid state rings. I should normally feel obliged to follow them as an obligation of stare decisis. So this is precedent, he's saying, you know, because they've already come to these decisions, I should follow along with those decisions. I quote from the decision of Judge Wilson in and Hansard Spruce Mills Limited. Here is the rule he sets out. I will only go against a judgment of another judge of this court if a subsequent decisions have affected the validity of the impugned judgment. B, it is demonstrated that some binding authority in case law or some relevant statute was not considered. C, the judgment was unconsidered, a nisi prius judgment given in circumstances familiar to all trial judges where the exigencies of the trial require an immediate decision without opportunity to fully consult authority. Or D, if none of these situations exist, I think a trial judge should follow the decisions of his brother judges. In this case, I do not feel obliged to follow my colleagues because I find that in none of these cases cited was a particular relevant authority considered. That authority is the French version of the prohibited weapons order, which is, of course, of equal force to the English version. So again, bilingual country, which means that the French version applies equally and can be a great assistance in terms of interpreting unclear language. So the, uh, the court's going to dive into the French, and I will admit that this exceeds my French knowledge, and I'll sort of explain why. So here is paragraph uh, D of section 2 in French. Uh, route bag muni de l'âme ou de pointe escamotable. And I don't know that word, but the judge is going to explain it. The key word is escamotable, which is the succinct French counterpart of the awkward English clause that are capable of being projected from the surface of the ring. So that one word means that whole thing. Gotta love uh, differences in language because sometimes they can be way more efficient or way less efficient. I'm using Harap's Standard French and English Dictionary of 1962. Really, they probably should have had a translator here or, you know, an expert in the French language to testify as to this, but they're relying on a dictionary and that's fine here. Uh, maybe not preferable. Using the same source, I translate French uh, paragraph D literally in its entirety as follows. Any ring furnished with concealable, disappearing, or retractable blades or points. Given the French version, I find it impossible to construe the English version as including rings with fixed projecting blades or sharp objects, which is what my brother judges have done, and quite understandably too. The awkward English phrase must be construed quite literally, that is to say, there must be blades or points that do not normally project from the surface of the ring, but that are capable of being projected from the surface of the ring. So this judge says they're not, you know, if it's a fixed spike, that doesn't fall into the, uh, the rule. Only if it's a spike that somehow extends from a position of concealment or from, you know, being retracted, does it then fall into the ban. So the judge goes on to say, I've never seen such a ring and I have no idea why such a bizarre object should be thought worthy of specific prohibition. Well, that describes most of the prohibited weapons in the prohibited weapons order that they don't make a whole lot of sense that they're banned. But uh, yeah, I, I always appreciate when a judge calls that out. But I can see no ambiguity in the language once the key is given and where that is so, there is no task of interpretation to be undertaken which requires me to consider the purpose and appropriateness of the prohibition. It follows that a solid state ring does not qualify under paragraph D and is therefore not a prohibited weapon and the charge is dismissed. So the judge says not prohibited because it only covers these, you know, unusual things that flick out. And again, the judge says, this is a bizarre object. I have no idea why you'd ban this. But that's what the statute clearly refers to when we consider the French. Now, that's not the only decision that's considered this issue, which is kind of surprising because these are a bit of an unusual object. But we also have the Alberta Provincial Court decision of the Queen and Colette. And once again, a Judge Fradsham decision. I'm becoming a bit of a Judge Fradsham fan. So continuing on here. Uh... So Judge, uh, Joseph Norman Collette is charged that he, again, having in his possession a nine-star quarter-inch ring, contrary to section 90 sub 1 of the Criminal Code, 
And this ring, uh, they he notes, in a commendable effort of cooperation to save valuable trial time, place before the court certain agreed facts. It is common ground, and of course accepted by me, that the accused was in possession on the date alleged of a ring silver in color, which bore the likeness of a skull wearing a World War II German-type helmet. Protruding from the helmet were a number of spikes about one quarter inch in length. That's not really a huge length for these spikes. So the ring is, to my observation, one piece and has no moving parts or mechanisms. Again, this is important. So, and they go through, they describe the, uh, the ban again. I take the position of both counsel to be that the ring falls within the definition of weapon, as it is found in section two. So defense conceded that, and I'm not really sure uh, why, because it seems to me that when we're talking about this sort of design of ring, it might be open to debate. It might be that this ring could be considered, instead of being a weapon, uh, just a decorative item. But defense conceded, and I'm not going to judge defense too harshly here because the defense wins this one. So, you know, as much as I sort of can armchair quarterback, armchair quarterbacking a win doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And they note, it is certainly capable of being used in the nature of a knuckle duster. Capable of being used as a weapon isn't the definition of a weapon because, of course, Lots of things are capable of being used as a weapon. If we remember a recent video, capable of being used as a weapon, but is not necessarily a weapon. All right, so they uh, they go through that definition. I'm going to skip over that for right now because I just want to talk about the spiked rings. So the ring in question might well have an ornamental aspect to its nature, but its design clearly lends itself to being used to threaten or intimidate people. Again, that applies to lots of things, you know, that it could be used to threaten or intimidate people. I'm not really a huge fan of this part of the analysis. So, counsel has suggested that I may need to consider the French version of Section 2D in order to uh, determine the intention of Parliament. That was the approach taken in the Queen and JM. So, the Queen and JM was explicitly put before this judge and... He doesn't think it's all that useful. He says, I do not think that the English version needs assistance to be understood. I would parenthetically note that the French version set forth in the Queen and Jam is not the current wording and can no longer be relied upon through the new, uh, though the new wording would lead to the same conclusion. The English version makes it clear that the ring to be prohibited must possess sharp, or blades or sharp objects that have a capability of being projected from the surface of the ring much in the way that a switchblade or flick knife can cause its blades to extend from the body of the knife. I specifically do not accept the reasoning that the projection referred to in section 2D can be satisfied by the simple projection of the hand wearing the ring. So he's rejecting the punching argument. This particular ring, being one piece with no movable parts, cannot fit within the definition set forth in section 2D of the order. The spikes which form part of the ring are not capable of being projected from the surface of the ring. They permanently project from the surface. The order is directed at rings which contain blades or sharp objects that can, at the instigation of the wearer, be raised from the surface. As reprehensible as I may consider the ring found in the possession of the accused, and as certain as I am that the accused possessed it for no good purpose, he doesn't like the accused here, he kind of thinks the accused is a bit of a bad person, uh, might prefer stronger words, but uh, the elements of the offense are not made out because I find that the ring is not a prohibited weapon as defined by prohibited weapons order number two. I find the accused not guilty. So what we have here is a whole bunch of case law on, you know, and this is, these uh, decisions seem to have been accepted by other courts. And so essentially the bottom line on it is that where the court is saying, hey, uh, you know, this particular definition, what it means isn't a spiked ring, but a ring with spikes that can be sort of extended that are ordinarily sort of potentially concealed. So these things are available for sale. I've found them online. You know, they can be purchased. You should not buy such a ring that, you know, has a extendable blade because again, prohibited weapon in Canada, but they do exist. I kind of agree with the judge in JM. I 
I don't know why you'd want one. I don't really know what the point of them would be, but, and I don't really see how they'd be dangerous. Um, if somebody's coming after me and their weapon is they can stick out, because most of these things have little tiny blades that are, you know, a quarter inch or a half inch long. Somebody comes up and sort of menaces you with this little tiny spike. I mean, I guess it's more menacing than if they didn't have the spike, but it's less menacing than, I don't know, a pocket knife? Like, this would worry me a lot more than that little spike. But Parliament, in its infinite wisdom, has decided that that's something that needs to be banned, and so it is. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope this has clarified, I guess, a bit of an obscure point, but sometimes people ask, you know, are spiked rings actually banned? Not really, if they're just sort of a, a spiked ring that's spiked all the time. Now, keep in mind, the courts have seemed to have found that they are willing to consider these to be weapons. And so that you also have the issue of, even if it's not a prohibited weapon, the court might and could, in these cases, uh, con decide to convict it of something like possession of a weapon for purposes dangerous to the public peace. If they think that you're carrying this weapon around in order to use it for self-defense purposes or the like. So those individuals in those pre, you know, in the cases we looked at weren't charged with that. But if they had been, I think these judges would have been willing to convict them. So again, maybe not the best thing, but not illegal to simply own. May well be illegal to wear around as a sort of, as a point of habit. Anyway. Thank you for watching. I want to thank my Patreon subscribers. I'm also going to see if I can link the cases in the description below. Uh, at the $50 level, DMO, People of Canada, Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, Canada's National Firearms Association, and Toronto Airsoft. At the $20 level, Cameron Johnson, Kevin Fleet, and Dale Nesbitt. As well as a number of you in at the $10 level who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge. And maybe some fashion sense, because I've, I've seen people wearing spiked rings, and typically that was sort of edgy kids in high school, which maybe not the, uh, not the look you're going for. Anyway, thank you once again, and until next time.